Good morning. Good morning. My name is Pooja Javaker, a fourth year industrial and systems engineering major and current president of the Undergraduate Student Government Association. <laughs> it is my distinct pleasure to open this year's institute address and to introduce our new president, Angel Cabrera. Since graduating with a doctoral degree, <laughs> Since graduating with a doctoral degree in cognitive psychology from Georgia Tech, Dr. Cabrera has enjoyed a, a career in academia and a reputation for global leadership. I had the opportunity to meet President Cabrera on Tuesday, and I'm so truly optimistic for what heights Georgia Tech will conquer under his leadership. Even in the very first conversation, his approachable nature and sincere regard for Georgia Tech were so, so apparent and emblematic of the yellow jacket spirit that we all share. We are fortunate to have someone with his experience as a leader to build upon the legacy of Bud Peterson and Wayne Clough. Dr. Cabrera, on behalf of the students, staff, and faculty assembled here today, as well as those watching via webcast, welcome home. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is a crazy moment for me. I hope you appreciate that. Uh, it is an incredible honor to be back to this place. That means so much for me and, and for my family. I am thrilled to be back. You may imagine that never in a million years when I was a student at uh, Skiles Building, of all places for four years, it never crossed my mind that one day I would be addressing you as uh, Georgia Tech's new president. It's absolutely um, exciting to be here. Pooja, thank you for that introduction. By the way, I, I, I have a very effective intelligence service uh, at Georgia Tech, which is my son, except that uh, his intel is fading away fast since he graduated in May. Uh, but it's still relevant enough you know, that I asked about, so who's this new president of the student government? And Alex's response, I think, was, she is awesome. Uh, and I, I was able to, uh, uh, to confirm that uh, yesterday. So um, uh, before, before I start, by the way, I was, I was given a, a choice when, um, when uh, I arrived. It's like we normally have the institute address, but it's going to be day three. It's not clear what kind of report of the institute you're going to be able to do on uh, day three in your job. Do you want to cancel it? Uh, it did cross my mind that that might have been a, uh, a good suggestion. But I thought, you know what? I think there might be some curiosity about who the new guy is. So let's keep it. So um, I will today share with you uh, some of my own thinking about what I hope to do uh, over the next year. I will share even some immediate actions, but I thought what I would do today is to introduce myself so uh, you know a little bit more about who I am beyond what you may have been able uh, to read. But before I do that, let me introduce two people who are as new as I am, and there might be others, but these are the two I want to point out, and number one is our new Dean of the College of Science, Susan Lozier. Susan, if you don't mind, uh, welcome, Susan. Your uh, ultimate test of loyalty will be uh, during basketball season. Uh, we'll, we'll see what colors you show up uh, in uh, to the game. Uh, welcome. I'm just so thrilled to get to work with you. And Jim Hudgens, who's uh, the new head of GTRI. Uh, thank you, Jim. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one of the immediate things, uh, as soon as I started studying about the Institute, uh, was how impressive the talent that we're able to attract, the talent that is represented in this room and, and beyond, is just absolutely uh, terrific. 
So um, before I, um, also I wanted to thank, very importantly, the folks who have helped me during the transition. It has not been a long transition, believe it or not. Uh, these transitions in academia tend to last a lot longer, and they become a little bit of a nightmare. This is, as far as transitions go, as short and sweet as it gets. Uh, and and the, uh, a, a big reason for why the transition has been extremely smooth is because of the incredible work of everybody in the president's office. They've done an enormous job uh, supporting us. Everybody in the systems office, uh, every member of the senior administration, some of them have been even going up to Virginia to, to brief me, to help me understand the state of affairs of the Institute. And very importantly, Bud Peterson, who's been great. His, his advice, his time, his generosity during the transition has been great, um, including, by the way, his, his last act of service to the Institute. When he asked me, okay, how, when do you want to start? If you need to take time to disconnect and relax, I understand these jobs are tough. Take your time. And I said, how about September 1st? And he said, that makes sense. And immediately says, thank you for holding down the fort while we play Clemson. That was, in fact, uh, <laughs> his, his last act of service, which I will forever uh, be grateful for. Uh, yeah. So um, I, let me, let me uh, tell you a little bit uh, more about me, and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll leave the podium for a second. Um, and I'll start with uh, introducing the other half of the Cabrera team, and that would be Beth Cabrera, uh, who's with us today. <laughs> Beth. Thank you. Uh, so, so Beth grew up in Florence, Alabama, and I grew up in Madrid. We met in orientation. We both came to tech for our, doctorate, uh, for our doctoral programs. Met in, met in orientation. We started dating a year later. Uh, we've been together ever since. We got married before we graduated. A whole bunch of um, uh, grad school friends came to the wedding in, uh, in, in, in Florence. And um, uh, after we uh, got married, she actually agreed to follow me to Spain. So. I remind you, she had no idea of Spanish when uh, we started going. I think she knew gracias, uh, hola, something like that, and cerveza, or I mean, uh, all the important stuff. So, so uh, we, we moved to Spain after graduating, and, um, and she took a job at a university at the time was a, a young university that was just starting in, in Spain, uh, Carlos III, Charles III University in Madrid. Uh, she was so optimistic about how quickly she could learn Spanish that she's sure, I, I can teach uh, in Spanish in my second semester. And as the second semester arrived, they let her teach in English something very, very uh, unusual in Spain in the first semester as the second semester was approaching. And uh, she said, I'm a little bit worried. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a total disaster. Uh, it, she actually uh, survived it. Uh, and uh, I'm told that uh, there was a lot of attention among the students who would come to her classes and bring their boyfriends and girlfriends uh, to see what this crazy American would say. Uh, <laughs> and I was at the time doing consulting in, in Turkey. And, uh, and she would call me and said, these, these Spanish students are so rude. Uh, you know, I, I, they laugh in your face. And it's like, well, what, what did you say? And, and, and she would repeat to me, which I will spare you, but she would repeat to me what she had said on the phone, and she would hear me laughing uh, from Turkey. Anyway, she gives me zero credit for her learning of Spanish. In fact, she gives credit to the Georgia Tech School of Modern Languages, where she started taking classes before, <laughs> before we moved to Spain. Uh, Beth, Beth ended up, uh, there's a good ending to the story. She ended up earning tenure at that university, which happens to be an exchange partner of Georgia Tech. Uh, for students, if you haven't studied abroad yet, do consider going abroad, and Carlos III, greatest city in the world, is an awesome choice. Just saying, uh, <laughs> Beth ended up being the, the, the first American to earn tenure at that university. Very, very proud of that achievement, and yeah. 
She even, she even earned an award to the best instructor in her department in Spanish, mind you. And, uh, and we, at some point in time during that time, we got to do some research together. As a matter of fact, the most cited paper I have ever written, or she, well, she argues she wrote it, but anyway, <laughs> we, that still is a, a little bit of an issue, but the, the, <laughs> the most cited paper I've ever had, which happens to be her most cited paper, we did together. So you would have thought that maybe we would have written more papers together. It never happened again. Now that we're back in Georgia Tech, my hope is that she might agree to do some writing with me in the future uh, to be continued. Um, you, you may have heard that we, we had two kids while we were in, uh, in Spain, Alex and uh, Emilia. Some of you know Alex because he just graduated in May. It was a very emotional moment to see Alex walk across stage and uh, shake Bud Peterson's, President Peterson's hand, and we were so proud of him. He's now a first-year PhD student in computer science. Uh, uh, Dean Isbell, well done. Uh, uh, he, he's, uh, he's now uh, really very excited about his new. My, my daughter, who's been, a, who's been feeling a little bit left out, uh, because in the stories, everybody talks about Alex being Georgia Tech. She did not go to Georgia Tech. She's a rising junior at Harvard. She's also a computer science major. I said, honey, you know, if you want to be part of the story, just get your Georgia Tech degree, and you can, al <laughs> you can always pick that. So anyway, hopefully, hopefully in the future, she'll come to her senses, and she'll, and she'll uh, come to... So, but anyway, now back, back to me. So I arrived, I arrived, oh, the, the, other, the other crazy thing, this is, I know it's so crazy, some of you are gonna be skeptical about this, but I swear to you, it is true. Beth and I, my, our first date, our first date was in this theater. It is crazy. It, it had just opened and uh, the Spanish Symphony performed here. And uh, I asked her to come with me, and we had a wonderful time. I just, it worked. Uh, so, but um, we, we, we came, of course, being a school at Georgia Tech, we care about data. Uh, this fact that I mentioned was carefully checked by our staff to make sure this was correct. <laughs> we, we still haven't been able to confirm the program of whatever, 1992. Uh, so you have to take my word for it. But, oh. <laughs> But Beth, Beth can, can confirm that. So it's even crazier that I'm now giving this presentation here. <laughs> it's just an unbelievable uh, life uh, twist. So when I arrived at Tech, uh, which was about 28 years uh, ago, almost to the day, and I, I arrived with two suitcases, like many of you did, because that's all that TWA allowed. That's all you could carry. I was totally depressed when uh, this weekend a huge truck showed up with boxes and boxes. It's like I, it felt a lot lighter when you're traveling with just two suitcases. But anyway, so I arrived, and you can imagine, and some of our grad students here probably will feel the same way when you, you arrive with a little bit of apprehension, oh my God, am I going to be able to, uh, to do this? Uh, with a lot of excitement. I mean, think about the dream of a lot of young people across the world is would I ever be able to study at one of those iconic, great research American universities, and here I am. And with all the questions about, oh my gosh, am I gonna be able to, to do this? Now, as it turns out, to make this even more unusual, I grew up in the great city of Madrid, but in a working class, neighborhood outside in the outskirts of Madrid to parents who did not go to college. So there was really the fact that I was able to go to a great engineering school in Spain, that I got my degrees, that I got to do research for, with a faculty member. By the way, it's a faculty member that has had some relationship with some faculty here, uh, a fact that I probably shouldn't have shared very widely. but. Uh, <laughs> All that was crazy, just that a kid like me could have gone to school, get a degree, do research, find out from my own faculty that there was such thing as a Fulbright scholarship that if you're lucky enough to get, would allow me to come to the United States to study. That was really unbelievable. And all those things happen, and when I'm here, I'm saying, what are the odds? A kid from a working class neighborhood in Madrid that is gonna be studying at a great American university. There's only one answer to that. And the answer is public higher education. That's the only answer. 
Bobnik, higher education. Um, and it's no exact, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, public universities really change their communities. They change the life of people, the life of their families. They create economic uh, uh, opportunity around them. Public universities change the world. I've always said this, and I truly believe it. Some people say, well, America has great universities because it's a wealthy uh, nation and can afford them. So it's the other way around. America is a prosperous nation. America is a driver of innovation and economic activity because it made investments in great universities. That's exactly how the, the cause-effect relationship uh, works there. Um, so um, most recently, before I was recruited to return to, uh, uh, to Georgia Tech, I spent the last seven years leading another public university called George Mason in Virginia, Northern Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. This is a very interesting, very different university, but very interesting place. It was set up as a spin-off of the University of Virginia to serve the outskirts of, of, of D.C., an area that, that at the time was sort of a sleepy suburb. And um, I think the intentions of the founders was to have just a nice state school for a place that didn't have uh, many offers. You fast forward two or three decades, and it's now the largest most diverse, fastest growing university in Virginia. Uh, as of 2015, it's now a Research One university in the Carnegie classification. It is the youngest research university in, in, the, in the nation. About 40% of their students are first generation college students, just like uh, as I was. Um, it's now a minority majority university, which is a true public university that has contributed to turn that old sleepy suburb of the nation's capital into a thriving hub of innovation. It's a totally different place. And these kids of children of, of immigrants and minority kids and working class kids are now becoming the nurses, the teachers, the police officers, the accountants, the entrepreneurs, the engineers, the lawyers, the CEOs that have done all of that impact. So that's where I come from. Now, none of that is new to Georgia Tech. In fact, if you look at when and how and why we were founded was precisely to transform a city and a state that had been ravaged by a terrible civil war with the premise that we had to modernize the state's economy. That was, that was the founding mission of this place. How do we educate bright people, at the time, mind you, white male people, uh, to become the drivers of a change in the, uh, in the economy of, of, of the state? Fast forward, I did the math, 134 years? Something like that. Uh, <laughs> And you would agree that we have delivered on the promise and then some. So um, right now, we are one of the most sought after schools of engineering and technological universities in the world, one of the most admired universities in the world. I've looked at the numbers and this year, we have had about 37,000 applications for a little over 3,000 uh, um, entering students this year. That's crazy. 37,000 applications. Those of you who got your degrees here, you may never have gotten into Georgia Tech today, so be glad that you did it back then. Uh, and, and our strengths reach way beyond engineering. I mean, we have, in fact, about half of all undergraduate students are choosing majors outside of engineering in all sorts of other disciplines. And the, the nature and the diversity of our students has increased. Uh, we, of course, now um, have a growing number of, um, and almost, we are, I think, approaching half of our students are, are, are women. The diversity of backgrounds of our students is absolutely uh, beautiful. People from all over the world who want to study with us. Our research 
is leading to breakthroughs in virtually every field from artificial intelligence to sustainability to biomedical engineering to policy to business. Uh, we're making a difference in the way people, uh, people live their lives, in, 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 in health, in, in security, in, in, uh, in, in productivity, helping people live better, more pleasant lives. It's also, our research has also helped drive an amazing wave of innovation around us and uh, turning, helping turn Atlanta into a true hub of technology and, and, and innovation. This uh, Georgia Tech effect is obviously most visible on what happened across the connector on Fifth Street, uh, what we call Tech Square. Mind you, and those of you who also are uh, graduates of a certain age of this place, Fifth Street was a place you would never venture to uh, just a few years back. There was no reason to be there. There were many reasons not to be there. Uh, and somehow the Georgia Tech effect turned that decaying urban core into a thriving hub of innovation. And the Georgia Tech effect ain't over yet. And think about what's happening west of campus, the stuff that we're still going to be doing in, uh, in Tech Square and west and south of our campus. And more importantly, how this university is really turning Atlanta into an exciting hub of, uh, of, of innovation. Uh, we have also developed locations internationally and throughout the state. And now through online education, we're reaching thousands of students. This experiment of creating an online master's in computer science, so that you know, is not unnoticed outside of Georgia Tech. This little experiment has broken the market for uh, master's degrees in computer science. There is no other program of this magnitude and reach and impact anywhere in the United States, perhaps in the world. So through technology, we've also shown that we can reach students in an effective way, students that otherwise would not have access not just to Georgia Tech, may not have access to any degree that would help them grow in their, in, their, in their career. So really exciting how Georgia Tech has been innovating, not just here, really having an impact elsewhere and serving as a leader in, uh, in, in higher education at large. Now, like all public universities, we face important challenges. And, uh, but I feel sincerely that we face them from a standpoint of, of, of strength. I think the resources that we have here, the talent that we have here, the brand, the reputation that, that, that supports us, the ingenuity, the tradition of innovation that we have, I think positions us in a terrific way uh, to make, uh, to make a, 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 different, a difference. I have been witness to a lot of this because for the most part of the last decade, I served on the Georgia Tech Advisory Board, uh, first uh, with Wayne, uh, Clough and then with Bud Peterson. So I've, I've been a witness to a lot of the stuff that has been, uh, has been happening. And, and I'm quite impressed. Uh, we, we have been blessed with this very steady and very effective leadership uh, for the last few decades under Wayne and, and Bud. Um, therefore, my number one goal, uh, which I have written on my desk, is do not screw it up. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that is, uh, and, and at, le at least keep that trajectory going. And then uh, let's hope that we can even uh, find even more ambitious things that we can do uh, together. So one of the early things I want to do, and I need everybody's help, is we're going to conduct a new strategic planning process. Um, I'll tell you why and, and why this, this is so important. In uh, all, most universities operate with strategic plans. We have a strategic plan, which is about 10 years old. It's a strategic plan that has served us very well. I was a little bit involved at the very beginning uh, as part of GTAB in that, in that process. And it has served us very well. I mean, when you look at the numbers of Georgia Tech in the last 10 years, it's been remarkable. Part of that has been driven by a sense of direction provided by this strategic plan. Some of that has been driven by opportunities, innovation, things that no one could have ever imagined. That's the life of an institution. Now, that plan was a little bit ambitious in the sense that it had a 25-year horizon. Uh, and, you know, the world kind of changes in 25 years. 
uh, the assumptions and the reality that we lived 25 years ago is a little bit different, or, or 10 years ago is a little bit different than it is today. So because we're in the middle of a presidential transition, because we've completed a campaign, because we've completed 10 years of a very successful uh, 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 journey, this is a very natural opportunity for us as a community to come together and ask ourselves, what is it that we want to do together as a community? That's what the strategic plan is going to allow us to do. So expect a lot of opportunities for engagement. And I'm going to be working uh, with the team. I'll introduce you a couple of people. But um, to bring all the voices together, to sort of try to distill the aspirations that all the members of our community have. Now, strategic, strateg strategy and strategic plans are about making choices. So just, it's not like, oh, we're going to put a list of everybody's wish is going to be. That's not a strategic plan. That is maybe a letter to Santa Claus or something. That's something else. <laughs> uh, a strategic plan is, is about choices. But those are choices informed by the ideas, the desires, the aspirations of the entire community. So we're going to get us organized. Stay tuned for details. But we'll get organized so students can be part of that conversation. Of course, the faculty, the staff, the alumni, the elected officials, people in our community, the employers. We want to hear everybody, and then we'll make choices out of that. To help us in that journey, I have uh, twisted the arm of an esteemed colleague who uh, has worked with me for more than 10 years and who agreed to join me at um, Georgia Tech, and that is Frank Neville. Let me introduce our new chief of staff and Senior Vice President. So uh, just as a little bit of background, uh, Frank uh, was my Chief of Staff at George Mason. He also worked as our Vice President of Communications and, and Marketing. Before that, when I uh, was the President of Thunderbird, which is now part of Arizona State University, he was um, also Head of uh, Global Communications and public, and public Affairs. So I've known him for a long time. Before that, he was a career diplomat. And uh, be careful, those uh, Spanish speakers and Chinese speakers, because he's fluent in both. So <laughs> if you... Uh, so just, just be, 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 be aware of that. Um, anyway, one of the things that in, in his portfolio he will have is a little bit of a different arrangement than what we've had until now, is that the strategic consulting group, Sonia Alvarez and, and her team, Sonia, uh, the strategic consulting group <laughs> will be, which uh, until now has operated under the EVP of administration and finance, will be now uh, reporting on to, uh, to Frank and will be fully involved in this strategic planning uh, process. So I, I really, uh, I'm so excited to uh, get to work with you and the rest of the team. Now, um, let me also mention and, and, and dedicate a, a word of appreciation to the person who has been until now Chief of Staff, and that's Lynn Durham. Uh, Lynn. So I, I have known Lynn for, uh, for many years uh, when I was a member of GTAB, and she did just such an amazing job uh, getting us organized and always supporting the work of GTAB. And during the transition, she has been really uh, my uh, to-go person. She's been absolutely fabulous, providing all the information that I need. She still is. And uh, in the last few months, you may recall that she was working as interim vice president of community uh, of um, uh, government and community relations. So she is now going to do that on a permanent basis, but I've named her uh, a vice president of institute relations. So it's a little bit, it's an expanded role. That would include not only uh, our relationships in, in, in downtown uh, with elected officials, and, but also to try to help us do better in all the strategic relationships we have with actors, companies, organizations in Atlanta, in Georgia, around the, the, the nation and the world. You know, every organization as complex as ours, it's hard, sometimes it's hard for the right hand to know what the left hand is doing, and we're sometimes surprised each other when you go to a meeting, it's like, oh my gosh, I had no idea, I'm raising a gift and no idea that you have been employed. I mean, we all struggle with those issues, so I've asked uh, Lynn, among other things, to chair an external relations council to help us get uh, better, better organized. So I very much look forward to working with you, Len, in your in your new capacity. And thank you for everything you've uh, you've done. Uh, those changes are immediate, so 
feel free to give them all the trouble you want in, <laughs> in their new capacity. They're already uh, installed. Um, the, the other thing, I, I know some of you are very intrigued about the search for our new EVP of administration and finance. All I can tell you is that the process is going well. We're making progress. We're in great hands. Al uh, Trujillo, the president of our foundation, has kindly volunteered or vol voluntold, or I don't know how that works, but she's doing, he's doing a great job leading, leading that search. More information to come. Uh, now, as much as I've spent a lot of time thinking about our future and trying to get us organized for, uh, for a strategic plan, I've also spent the summer reading as much as I can about today. And no matter how many meetings of GTAB I may have attended or the memories that I have as an alum or the experiences as a, as a parent, this place is so darn complex. So be a little bit patient uh, with me as I continue my learning process. And, and not just patient, but be helpful. I mean, I have had meetings, even uh, the meetings I had with both the undergraduate student government and the graduate student government association, they were both so incredibly well prepared. They, they, they brought me a terrific document, uh, letting me know about uh, the, sort of a little bit of the history. Uh, a little bit of what they're trying to accomplish. Everything you can do to help me get there as fast as I can is much, much appreciated. But there are already a few themes that have become clear to me that are on people's minds and that I should be paying special attention to. If I don't mention your issue, it doesn't, matter, it doesn't mean that I don't care about your issue. Uh, these are so far the most important issues that have raised to, to, to the top. Um, one of them, without a doubt, Student mental health. Uh, yeah. it, is, it is not only a Georgia Tech. This is a nationwide issue, and it is a worrisome issue. And it is an issue that two years ago on this campus, we had a heartbreaking example of what can happen uh, when left unaddressed. We have to do everything that we can to take care uh, of students while they're, while they're here. And the more aspirational Georgia Tech is, and the more demanding the Georgia Tech is, the more likely it is that uh, mental health issues are gonna continue to be an issue. And it is an issue that requires everybody's participation, not just the administration. I've been delighted to see some of the work that has been done uh, in the last two years, very excited about the care center uh, right out there. I guess it's in the, in the flag uh, building, uh, which is sort of a, a, a first a one place where you can go. You can walk in. If you need help, you can walk in. If you know of a friend in school who's having issues, now you have something very concrete to advise that friend to do. And when I say it's everybody's issue to solve, I mean it because sometimes it is a friend or it's an RA or is a faculty member who detects that something is not right. And we all need to be prepared when that is the case to say, this is effective, useful advice that I can, I can provide. By the way, I received a, um, a communication piece, which I hope all faculty have received. If not, you can harass John Stein uh, appropriately to get your copy. Love this thing. I mean, this is something I hope all of you keep on your desks. Uh, with a very easy way to get resources, some very basic advice of what can I do if I'm aware that someone is having an issue. So I will continue to work. Uh, by the way, I've also looked at some of the changes and the new training in the police department. Some of the work students themselves are leading, very, very impressive. I will be working as much as I can to help on, 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 on that. Uh, another area which I have been very involved uh, personally in the, over the last years, and it's, an, again, an issue that is, it, it, it's a very important issue, not just in Georgia Tech and higher education at large, but we have to take very, very seriously is sexual violence on our campuses. And it's an issue that is, doesn't seem to be getting any better. When you look at uh, the research that is being done about prevalence of sexual assault and sexual violence on campus, it's not getting very be much better. We have to do better, we have to do everything. The only thing that seems to be improving, and that's a good sign and something we need to be working on, is that when someone is a victim of sexual violence, they seem to be a little bit more inclined to reporting it, which is, of course, the beginning of us being able to do something about it. We need to keep working on that. 
one of the changes, again, this is a small change and part of many other things we need to do, but one, uh, after a lot of consideration uh, with, um, with several members of the administration, with Ling Ling Ni, uh, with, uh, with Archie, Irvin, and with others, I, I decided to transfer the Title IX office from the office of the general counsel to uh, the renamed Office of Institute Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And, and th this is why our top priority in cases of sexual violence is the well-being of the individuals involved. That has to be top of mind. When, when a case of sexual violence happens, the well-being of the people who are involved must be our top priority. And I hope that this change will underscore that, uh, that priority very, very clearly. We're also moving ADA function uh, to, uh, to Institute Diversity. And I, I really, I wanna thank Archie and, and Ling Ling uh, for the work you've done to make that change happen. Uh, they are working to implement those changes and just stay tuned for, for details. I just wanted you to know that that's gonna be happening. Now, another area that is dear to my heart where I've been spending a lot of my time and efforts and uh, is the area of diversity and inclusion in, in institutions of higher education. What an amazing timing was for me to be here yesterday on day two in the job for this fabulous summit on uh, symposium on, on diversity uh, for the unveiling of the new statues. Uh, congratulations, uh, Archie and your entire team and everybody else who was involved. What a day. By the way, if you uh, couldn't be there for the panel, with the first three African-American students of Georgia Tech and the first graduate of Georgia Tech. They were brought together for the first time for the symposium yesterday. If you weren't there in the room, watch the video. This was absolutely moving, inspiring uh, stories to hear and a reminder that the job is never done. That as long as one individual has a hard time coming to tech for reasons other than their talent and their potential. As long as that is the case, we have work to do. So uh, that was a beautiful reminder. If you have not seen the statues, do yourself a favor after this, if you have time, and just walk up to, is it called Harrison? Harrison Square. Harrison Square. Ah, I'm getting there. Uh, <laughs> and just, or go to the uh, Clough uh, Center where the other statue is and just, just pause and look at the statues and reflect on what they mean. What a, what a day. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Now, um, as I mentioned yesterday, I also got to spend time uh, with the uh, Women in Engineering uh, program. What a terrific, pro I was so impressed uh, yesterday. And I'm so impressed about the efforts that we're doing to increase diversity, even in areas where traditionally we've had a hard time enrolling women and people of color. Engineering and computer science are at the top of that list. And I'm delighted of the progress that Georgia Tech has done in that, in that space. But we need to continue to do uh, uh, much more. I'm, I'm going to pay a lot of attention to that area. Another area that I know is on people's minds, ethics. And I know that it's been sort of a painful last two years. Now, I've, I've read a lot. I've read the, some of the public pieces, some of, the, some of them not very fair, some of them maybe a little bit uh, too harsh on us, but it doesn't matter. The fact is, when it comes to ethical issues, always the truth is in the eye of the, of the beholder. I know for a fact that the vast majority of people at Georgia Tech care too much about this place to do anything that, it, that would hurt in any way the Institute. I know that for a fact. Unfortunately, and you know this as well as I do, it may take years to build your reputation, and it just takes a couple of bad actors or bad actions to lose it. And we are a public institution. That means that not only we need to be good and we need to do the right things, our community needs to know and be aware. We have to earn their trust. And I know that we have lost at least a little bit of that trust in the last two, uh, two years. We have to work very hard to regain it to whatever extent we may have lost it. Um, so we have to work both on the area of strengthening our culture of ethics. This is also a never-ending process. You have to keep going at it. 
it's also everybody's role and responsibility, and also strengthen our culture of transparency. Again, do the right thing, make sure the world knows that we're doing the right thing. We have to be working on both. Now, um, I've, I know, by the way, that the last two years in some of these allegations about, um, uh, about ethical misconduct, I know they've been particularly painful. They've been painful for all of us. They've been particularly painful for my predecessor, Bud Peterson. I know he cared a great deal. I know he's worked very, very hard uh, to try to address those issues. One of the th great things he did is to bring us uh, Ling Ling Ni. Ling Ling, I don't know if you've been, if people know you, or do you mind standing up so people can at least associate a... Yeah. So Ling Ling, uh, who came as our uh, general counsel, but with an expanded portfolio, which is, uh, she's our chief ethics officer. She's gonna be our champion to help us do better. It's not like, oh, ethics is Ling Ling's problem. We hired her, she's great, now I'm done. She's gonna be our champion, she's gonna provide us resources, it's all of our priority. Now, um, Ling Ling, by the way, um, uh, it is a special day because we just found out, I don't know if this is embargo to top secret, but what the heck, we're among friends. She was just announced, it is embargoed. It, sorry, I, I already spelled a bit. She, anyway, she's been named uh, by the Atlanta Business Chronicle uh, in the top 40 under 40. We're very proud of you. Yeah. So. Anyway, uh, also expect announcements on changes. She's been working for the last few months in the background trying to figure out how to set up the right structure uh, to help us do better. Uh, those changes are gonna be announced uh, shortly. Among other things, she's also gonna be launching a campaign. She's gonna be in our face, our team, communications, reminding us what it is we, we can do, what it is we cannot do. Sometimes we wanna do the right thing and we simply may not know what's the right thing or what's the wrong thing. We're gonna try to figure out a way for you, for all of us to have fewer excuses, uh, so to make sure we all know. So uh, expect a lot of work coming from her office. On the transparency issue, uh, again, to earn the public trust, we need to be able to tell our story better. So this is another change we're making. As a public institution, we're subject to open records regulations. Welcome, Susan, to the wonderful world of public institutions, <laughs> where everything you write in an email is now the public record. So. Uh, Right now, we have responded to open records requests through the, through the Office of the General Counsel. We're moving that to the Office of Institute Communications under Rene. And the, 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 the motivation of that change is to ensuring that when we receive an open records request, that we, that we use that as an opportunity to tell our story better as an opportunity to really be transparent, to make sure people know uh, what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, so that is, that th there's gonna be a new, a new office uh, within her shop that is focusing on responding to open records, telling our story, relationships with the media, making sure the world knows what we're up to. So that's another change that is pretty immediate. Now, in the category of trying to practice what I preach, I, I will try to communicate as much as I can. Um, I will write a blog. I've been writing a blog um, uh, for years. I continue that here in my blog. I might write about things that are happening here, things that, are, that I'm working on elsewhere, my thoughts about what's going on in higher education. Also, I, I, after a month of detox from Twitter, I... <laughs> I got back into it about two days ago, and uh, so if you want to follow my whereabouts or my thoughts, I will be tweeting uh, at uh, Cabrera Angel. Um, I also am on uh, Instagram. Uh, by the way, uh, thanks to the Society of uh, Black Engineers, they introduced me to the concept of a boomerang. Uh, thank you. I never felt as cool as I did uh, after this boomerang experience. Uh, those of you who don't know what a boomerang is, this is your excuse to actually go to Instagram and follow me, and you'll see 
the very cool Instagram. Um, if you want to email me at any time, feel free to do that. Uh, if you email uh, to president at Georgia Tech, that eventually gets to me, but it goes through other people before it gets to me. If you want it to get to me directly, email at angel.cabrera at gatech.edu. By the way, when I arrived, I was given AC50. Uh, I'm like, I'm the president. Can you not give me anything better, AC50? And say, sorry, that was your username when you were a grad student, and it was... <laughs> And, and, and it's still, the, it's still you're in the system. So anyway, they put an alias. So angel.cabrera at uh, Gatic should work. Finally, finally, I, I invite you if, you, if you stop me, if you want to stop me on campus anytime, uh, stop me, say hi. Uh, by the way, I love to be uh, referred to by my first name. I know it's a little bit of a hard to pronounce for English speakers. Your uh, free Spanish lesson for the day, the way you pronounce it is Angel. Angel, so if you want to venture into it, I love to hear my first name. If you, otherwise, call me anything that you please. But I'm always <laughs> delighted to, uh, to talk to you and, and learn more about uh, what your work is. In fact, that's one of the fun, uh, the greatest things of working at a university, that you're surrounded by such an amazing group of interesting people doing all sorts of things. That's what actually gets us going, so please do. I, in closing, I'm so, really so excited to be back at, at Georgia Tech, and I am so, um, uh, so proud. And not just because of the accolades and the rankings, which they're pretty darn good. This is embargoed, but maybe, perhaps, there might be some good news coming. Maybe. That's okay to say? Okay. Maybe, perhaps, soon. Uh, Hey, I, I, love, I love rankings, don't take me wrong. I will boast and uh, brag shamelessly when the rankings are, are, are good. But really, that's not what we're here for. And that's not our end game, to please the editorial staff of any rankings media. That's not what we're here for. We're here to make a difference in the world. We're here to serve the state of Georgia. We're here to serve our nation. We're here to make the world a better place. That's what we do, to give opportunity to young people to develop their full potential and be able to uh, do great things in life. And that's how we ought to measure our success, not by how many positions we may go up or down on some rating. Are we making a bigger difference in the world? That is the end game. At Georgia Tech, is a great technological university, and that's absolutely part of our identity. We're also a great public university. And even during this strategic planning process, I want us to think carefully about what does that mean, to be a great public university. We're a strategic asset for Atlanta. We're a strategic asset for Georgia. We're a national resource in the fabric of research and innovation, just surpassed a billion dollars in research awards, that is nuts. For a school without a medical school, that is unbelievable. Um, yeah. We are also a global hub of innovation, and we hold the answers to some of the most pressing issues that we deal with in the world. And just as an example of how important that is to me and the attention I'm going to be play, paying to this, in a couple of weeks or maybe 10 days, I will be in New York City with leaders from the United Nations, the Rockefeller Foundation, and other universities from around the world to announce the establishment of a new university global compact, a platform of universities committed to how can we make a difference in the, in the issues that matter the most in, in, in our world, how can we drive uh, progress. It is in places like this, like Georgia Tech, with extraordinary talent and a strong mission of public service that we will find our best path forward. Progress and service, that's what it's all about. I'm happy to be back home. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Cabrera. We do have time for a few questions. Uh, there are microphones throughout um, at the end of each stairwell. If you'd like to 
walk to those. In the meantime, we had a couple pre-submitted questions, and one you just started to lead into. Um, there were many questions about your thoughts on sustainability on campuses. Uh, so, historically, institutes of higher education are falling behind the private sector uh, in actively planning for and measuring progress on a sustainable built environment. What's your stance on that? And how should we approach our campus plan associated with it? Well, thank you. Delighted to be asked that question, by the way. Um, the, first of all, I've been incredibly impressed by what's going on on campus, and I only knew half of it, if that much, so impressed. Um, the eco commons and how issues of sustainability are now being reflected in our, in our design of our spaces, of our campus. The Candida building, which I am dying to tour. I haven't had a chance to do that yet, but I'm really dying to get to tour it. Um, the initiatives in, 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 in the, for, for students. Uh, Professor Beryl talked, they to, told me yesterday about the Serve, Learn, Sustain. Uh, program, the fact that we now have a regional center of expertise uh, in, uh, for uni with the United Nations for, uh, for sustainable uh, development, the work that we're doing in our community. I absolutely love what I'm hearing. The resources, the, the, the center, I think the um, uh, Kim Cobb Center in uh, Global Solutions, I forgot the, the name of that. Uh, I, I really can't wait to learn more of what's going on. But really, I'll tell you, one of the the, the issues that really uh, bother me a lot about our existence is the questions about how we're gonna make this thing work for all of us. These are big questions. These are not just nice to have. These are big questions. Uh, it's about 7.5 billion people right now. The expectations and demographics is one of the few social sciences that actually normally get things right because it's easy to apply statistical models. Uh, so we're about to be 10 billion people maybe towards the middle of the, of, the, of the century. In the US right now, we consume about three times as much energy per capita as the Chinese. We consume about 10 times per capita energy as the Indians. Why shouldn't they be allowed or encouraged to use as much energy as we do? Why would that be their aspiration? Imagine when it's 10 billion people of us wanting to have the same standard of living that we enjoy in this country. How are we gonna make all that work for everybody? Those are huge questions. And huge questions that have to do with economic uh, opportunity, with, with poverty, with water, with energy. Huge questions about climate change. So if you think about, if we wanna have an impact in the things that matter in the world, wouldn't we wanna start there? So that's why the, the work I'm doing with the United Nations hopefully will encourage some of the champions that we have. We have so many champions on campus to continue to catalyze efforts and continue to do a, a, a much more in that space. And it means our research, it means the way we educate our students, it means the way we as a campus become an example of smart, sustainable design for others. We now have a new dean of science who knows a thing or two about some of these big questions. Uh, so I know she's going to be a great, a, a great champion. Our School of Business has had uh, tremendous uh, uh, leadership in the space, College of Engineering. I mean, the strength is here. Just have to somehow figure out a way to aim it, uh, it so we can have the maximum impact. Sorry to extend myself. No, nope, that uh, was perfect. There yeah. were about four questions on that topic. So. Excellent. Got it. You okay, so time. I spent four times the time. Why okay. don't we go up here to the question in the stairwell? We're all really excited to have you here. Thank you, sir. Um, so the uh, Georgia Institute of Technology is very diverse, all sorts of different centers of energy and issues. What's your view of what the role of the president of the institute is? What's my view on the role of the president? Yeah, given that there's all so much going on, not, not what issues you're trying to confront, but given that there's so much going on and so many people uh, acting on what's going on, what's so, your view of the president's role? Uh, being president of an institution of higher learning is an amazing job, first of all. It is intense, it is stressful, uh, it is complex, it is demanding, and it is awesome. The highs are very high, the lows can be miserable. This is just a message for my colleagues who may be considering maybe a presence in the future. Just, uh, we do need leaders. <laughs> uh, 
but, but I, I think at the end of the day, the way I look at leadership, not just the presidency of, of, of a university or, or institute, but, but in any, any uh, job, I, I really think org chart should be really drawn upside down, right? We, we put them, like, it, it looks like everybody exists to somehow support their boss. Wrong. Who does the work here? Who does the work here? It's the faculty in the labs, in the classrooms, serving our students. It's the staff that is getting the, the, the campus ready for us to do our work. Our job as leaders is to make sure we're supporting them so they can do their job. So as long as we keep that framework, for all of us who have a position of leadership, it doesn't matter if you're the president, you're a dean, you're a vice president, whatever your job is, the question when you get up in the morning is, how do I support the people who do the job so they can do better? It's almost like being a, a coach of a basketball team. You, you're helping your students, I mean, your, 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 your players do well, but you ain't going to play the game. You're not teaching the classes. You're not doing the research. You're not fixing the campus. You're not mowing the grass. You're there to support everybody who does. Thank you. Question down here. And if you don't mind, tell me who you are. That will be useful. Zach Taylor, public policy. Uh, Zach Taylor, public, School of Public Policy. Like, I, I, you, you teach, you study, what? All faculty teach. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Down in front. Good morning. Um, bon dia. Uh, bon dia. Bon dia. <laughs> uh, my name is Ian Helfrick, a PhD student from the Department of Economics. Uh, thank you very much for addressing us today. I know we're all excited to have you here. Thank you. Uh, you spoke a lot of plans for the College of Engineering. You mentioned the College of Business. How will you plan to extend Bud Peterson's legacy in developing the Ivan Allen School of Arts and Sciences? Sure. So uh, thank you for asking that, uh, that question. And that is the problem every time you mention one college. Is there <laughs> five others that you didn't mention? I love all of our schools equally. <laughs> the, uh, the School of Psychology a little bit more. but. Uh, but uh, all of the rest equally. Uh, so, no, but now, now seriously. One of the things that excite me about Georgia Tech is what I mentioned, that we have the resources, the talent, to drive real change, to create the next, the motto, uh, service, progress and service, progress for service, progress to make us better. To drive real change, is not just about technology. Technology is absolutely necessary, but technology in a vacuum won't cut it. It's technology that becomes a viable business. It's technology that influences better policy. It's technology in the hands of leaders who can make things happen. It's technology that is designed with an understanding of the economics implication. So I'm absolutely a fan, in fact, I'm so excited about being in a technological university that carries the name on its title. But because of that, to have the full impact of what that means, we need to be equally strong in all those other disciplines. So I'm just looking forward to working with the provost and the deans to make sure that we're equally excellent in all those areas as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last question from our pre-submitted questions. Uh -huh. uh, yes, I have a little this advantage. is from a student, Jose, in aerospace engineering. He's, ha he's asking, having initially come to us um, as an international student, what advice do you give current international students to achieve success at tech in the US and beyond? Well, uh, first of all, um, a special word for uh, my fellow international students. I was one of them. Uh, and I, 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 I'll tell you, for A, uh, it is an incredibly fantastic part of Georgia Tech that we have this rich population of international students. International student uh, enriches the life of this campus for everybody else. It adds new perspectives. Uh, I mentioned this yesterday, one of the few uh, areas of consensus in cognitive psychology is that we need diversity of perspectives to learn. That's when learn, learning happens. So that is fantastic. Now, for you as an international student to get the best experience that you can from Georgia Tech, I have 
one suggestion, which is you have to engage. And engaging means, yes, you can engage and you should engage with people who share maybe your cultural background. I'm Indian and I'm, I'm going to have a group of Indian friends. I'm Spanish like I was and I'm going to get together on weekends to play dominoes with my friends from Venezuela and Puerto Rico and, uh, and, and uh, maybe taste some spirits. I mean, whatever. We, we, uh, all that is great, but my, my suggestion is don't just get yourself in that group. Branch out. Engage in things that have nothing to do with your place of origin. Get to know the natives. I did, I, I actually, after spending a lot of time with my Spanish-speaking friends, I made the conscious decision that I had to engage with the natives. I actually started going out uh, with a group of classmates. I did such an extraordinary job getting to know the natives that I married one. <laughs> so, be, I mean, so be careful with this suggestion. It's good for you, <laughs> but it can get out of hand. So, but no, really, engagement is my best advice and, and, and really uh, a, a, a kind word of welcome and appreciation to every international student on our campus. President Cabrera, thank you for spending the time during your first week for the Institute Address. Uh, we're going to end today with a preview of the new Georgia Tech public service announcement. And President Cabrera will be out front for a short time to take a few more questions if you have them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. From inner space to cyberspace, to outer space. What we're doing in our own backyard.